Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final plenary session before lunch. So, uh, I'm Lori Kinney. I'm the Director of Communications and Public Education for Justice at Stake. And we're calling this panel Talking the Talk. And we're going to do something a little different with this panel. We're going to give you a little entertainment, a little showmanship, I think. Um, I want to welcome our panelists, Mike Petro, the Executive Vice President of the Committee for Economic Development. Eric Lesh, who uh, directs the Fair Courts Project at Lambda Legal, and Diane Russ Tierney, who is the Executive Director of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. So one of the things that we hope to accomplish here and in our work at Justice at Stake in general is to help advocates for other interest areas understand how to make Fair Courts advocacy part of their agenda and part of their mission and essential, uh, show how it's essential to their work as well. And one of the other things we hear a lot is, how do we make this issue relatable for people uh, and for, for those who are attracted to those interest areas because that's where their passions lie? So we're going to do a little demonstration. This is the tell part, this is the show part rather of show and tell. We thought it would be more interesting for people to kind of see how this is done than maybe to necessarily show you a PowerPoint with a list of do's and don'ts and, and things that we so often see. Um, we asked Mike Petro not too long ago to do a little experiment with us. And we said, Mike, we want you to talk about justice and stake and the fair courts issue to a business community, as you normally would, off the cuff. What would you do if someone asked you to make a presentation like this? And then we videotaped it. And then we said, Mike, now we want you to go about this from a completely different perspective. We want you to speak from the heart about why you care about the issue, and we want you to tell a story. And we want it to be a personal story, something that resonates with you and that, and that you think will connect with people. So what we're going to do today is we're going to show you Mike's before video, and then we're going to ask Mike to give his after talk, and we're going to also ask Eric and Diane to follow up with some personal talks that they might use to connect uh, with their audiences. So here's the before video. Well, first, thanks for having me here today. Um, I, I think the best way to describe justice at stake is that it's an organization that uh, basically is working to keep the courts fair and impartial. And I think all Americans have a stake in justice at stake, but especially the business community. You know, the business community, it's important uh, that they win their cases, obviously. But what's more important is that there is a fair and even playing field. And, um, you know, it's interesting when you look at some um, surveys, especially the Chamber of Commerce survey, oftentimes companies decide uh, where they're going to locate or where they're going to relocate in states that have a, uh, a fair, a litigious climate. So Justice at Stake fights to do several things. First, it tries to keep uh, the, the, the hard political um, uh, rhetoric out of campaigns. Uh, we fight to uh, diversify the courts. We fight to add uh, funding to the courts because for so long uh, these courts operate with not enough funding. Uh, we also have a federal component to our work. So we worry about the judiciary, the state of the judiciary, and it's important for us to keep uh, what I would say the, the money and the rhetoric and the hard political um, rhetoric out of, of the judicial uh, selection process. Okay. And now, the after talk. <laughs> Are we on? Um, I could see um, everybody starting to fall asleep during. That's the first time <laughs> I've actually ever seen that. So in my defense, um, it was a bad day. I was tired. And, <laughs> and I was unscripted. They literally just sat me down and said, talk, you know. So, so um, now I'm going to humiliate myself further. Um, so I grew up in Levittown, New York, in a very politically sensitive and aware family. My parents believed that public service 
and the, the political process was an honorable thing. Unlike some of the cynics of the time, they believed that politics was a good thing and that, that not all politicians were corrupt. And my parents made voting um, a big deal in our family. And so when I was little, my parents would take us to the voting booth and we would get to vote with them. It's when they had those curtains and you would have the privacy, right? And then afterward, they would take us out to breakfast at a waffle house. And, oh, those waffles tasted so great, <laughs> right? And so, as I grew up, I thought, gee, a life in the political process, a life in public service would be a great thing because it was part of my growing up. And so I came to Washington in 1981 and I became involved in many political campaigns, more than I can remember, most of them lost, okay? But I became a fundraiser, and I started to get really good at it. And in 1986, the Washington Post wrote a big story about me, and they called me the Pac-Man, because I was raising all this Pac money for all these Senate candidates. And I was kind of thinking I was pretty hot stuff, right? And then a couple of years went by, and I, I, I no longer felt good about the process and about the system. Where I was raised that this was an honorable profession, I didn't think I was doing anything really wrong, but I didn't think I was doing anything really right. And that's the reason why I came here. And so, in the 1990s, I started to work in public policy to promote good public policy on behalf of various different groups. And I found myself at an organization where I still am, the Committee for Economic Development, a business-led public policy organization. We're comprised of about 180 business leaders who care about the country and care about policy. And I got myself engaged there. And one of the issues that are research and policy committee, the committee that decides the next issue we're gonna take on. One of the issues that came to the forefront was judicial selection reform because our members were tired of being hit up for contributions and they were concerned about the future of the judiciary. And so we had a meeting of about 15 executives around the table talking about whether or not this long-standing public policy organization should engage in judicial selection reform. And at, in the middle of that meeting, one of the executives got up and he left the room. And 10 minutes later, he came back and he interrupted the discussion and said, with his cell phone, he said, now, I just had a message from a judge in my state asking me for a political contribution. And he said, gentlemen, those old men, old white guys, we have to take on this issue. This is important for the future of the country and it's important for the future of the business community. And so CED took on this issue. And they looked at me and they said, and you're going to run this thing, the Pac-Man. They didn't know that I was the Pac-Man. <laughs> and so I, I got myself immersed back in this process. This process I was, I was taught to endear, that I ran away from, but I came back to and I could smell the waffles again, right? I could smell the waffles. I joined the Justice at Stake board. I was one of the original board members of Justice at Stake. I'm still somehow involved. I don't exactly, you know, I had board on my thing, but I don't, I'm no longer on the board. And I've been engaged in these issues for the rest of the time. So my personal story is I started off thinking that this was an honorable profession, I got sort of sidelined, and I'm back, and I, as I said, I, I can smell the waffles when I look around and look at all of you, I can smell the waffles. Thank you. Eric. Great. Um, 
So I'm going to start with a disclaimer. You all were promised an aha moment in your programs, um, but I make no pledges or promises that I will deliver an aha moment. I hope you enjoy it, though. Um, June 22nd is a day that will remain as a day of victory in the history of the LGBT rights movement in the courts. On June 26th in 2003, Lambda Legal won a landmark ruling in Lawrence versus Texas, where the Supreme Court struck down all laws criminalizing private, personal relationships for members of our community. On June 26, two years ago, the Supreme Court struck down the discriminatory Defense of Marriage Act in U.S. v. Windsor. And then this June 22nd, the Supreme Court declared that denying loving same-sex couples the freedom to marry violates the U.S. Constitution. At Lambda Legal, we are particularly proud that that fight to win the freedom to marry was ultimately won in the courts. You may have heard of the stories of the plaintiff, Jim Obergefell, who lost his husband tragically to ALS, and how he came back to Ohio and was denied a death certificate, recognizing that he was married. Or of our plaintiffs, Rob and Joe, who were married in New York, adopted their beautiful son, Cooper, but were told by the state of Ohio that they would have to pick which one of them would remain a legal stranger to their son because only one would be recognized on the birth certificate. Those stories are why we fight for justice and equality in the courts, but in order to vindicate constitutional and legal rights, we have to fight for fair and impartial courts to enforce these rights. So I'd like to focus my remarks on some of the stories that you maybe haven't heard, like the mother in Alabama who was denied custody of her three teenage children by the Alabama Supreme Court simply because she was a lesbian or the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court who wrote in that opinion that her relationship, her long-term same-sex relationship, was abhorrent, immoral, detestable, and a crime against nature. You may have heard, not have heard of Christine Ann Harvey, a transgender woman who nervously made her way to Oklahoma State Court to receive a routine name change so that she could live in accordance with her true identity. Her name change petition was denied by Judge Bill Graves, who wrote in the petition that to grant a name change in this uh, action would be to uh, participate in what is fraudulent. And I want to read the scripture so that I get it just right. He wrote in the opinion, it is notable that Genesis states, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. When his decision was reversed by the Court of Appeals, Judge Graves flippantly told the press, well, I guess the guy gets to get his name changed. You may not have heard of the married same-sex couple living in Texas who, like many couples do, uh, separated in 2009. They filed an uncontested petition for divorce. Uncontested, that is, until the entire state of Texas intervened, arguing that because they didn't recognize their marriage, they would not allow them to get a divorce. So they took the case all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court, where the Texas justices who were elected sat on the case for nearly five years without issuing a decision until two months ago, one of the parties to the case ultimately died, still trapped in a legal status, still waiting for justice. You may not know that many of those justices, all of those justices of the Texas Supreme Court are elected and have flashy campaign websites that tout um, endorsements from the likes of James Dobson or Texas Values voters. You may not have heard of the story of Calvin Burdine, whose lawyer fell asleep during his uh, murder trial, or the prosecutor who walked up to the jury in his closing statement and said, you know, sending a homosexual to the penitentiary really isn't that bad a punishment for a homosexual, or that his lawyer didn't object or that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that a defendant in a capital murder case doesn't have an absolute constitutional right to an attorney who will stay awake for an entire proceeding. Finally, you may not have heard that just this Monday, a decision came down, um, a dissent from a justice who's elected 
of the uh, Louisiana Supreme Court. Um, and we don't run ads here, so I'm just going to give you some of his ad. But this, this, this was what he did when he ran. President Obama would never appoint Judge Jefferson Hughes. Judge Hughes is pro-life, pro-gun, and pro-traditional marriage. Thank you, Republican Party of Minnesota v. White. Uh, so the um, case involved a recognition of a same-sex uh, union from out of state. The Supreme Court ruled that Obergefell was the law of the land, um, and so they dismissed the case as moot. But there was one dissenter, and um, Justice Hughes in uh, that case uh, said that he would set aside his duty to uphold the rule of law and not follow Obergefell, and uh, added this reprehensible line. This case involves adoption. The most troubling prospect of same-sex marriage is the adoption by same-sex partners of a young child of the same sex. But he's up for re-election, so. So is it any surprise that a 2014 Lambda Legal Survey found that LGBT people and people living with HIV just don't trust the courts to deliver justice? Nearly 27%, only 27% of transgender people and 33% of LGBT people of color said they generally trusted the courts. That was 7% lower than those populations said that they generally trusted the police. 19% in our survey said that they'd overheard a judge, an attorney, or a court employee make a negative comment about someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. 16% said that their sexual orientation or gender identity was raised in a court proceeding when it wasn't relevant. 15% had their HIV status disclosed when it wasn't relevant in a court proceeding. A critical component of our democracy is public trust in the judiciary and the ability of litigants to receive due process and access to justice in their cases. These stories are why Lambda Legal fights for fair and impartial courts. They're why we joined an amicus brief in William Julie and in Wolfson v. Concanon, the Arizona case, with our fair courts partners, because as Chief Justice Roberts wrote, judges are not politicians. It's why we work to support merit retention for judges. It's why uh, R.J. Thompson, who's my colleague, goes out and educates uh, judges and court staff by delivering implicit and explicit bias trainings and cultural competency trainings. It's why we work to make sure that uh, LGBT people, people of color, uh, women, people with strong civil rights backgrounds like Justice Marshall don't continue to be significantly underrepresented on the judicial bench. Uh, and it's why that we're really excited we're going to be launching a part on our website, uh, Know Your Rights in Courts, so that LGBT court users can advocate for themselves, or if they expen experience discrimination, they can call our help desk for assistance. Um, and it's why I'm eager to work with so many of the groups in this room to support fair and impartial courts, not only for the politically popular and the socially uh, politically well-connected, but for marginalized, vulnerable, and politically unpopular populations. Thank you. Hard acts to follow. <laughs> Good morning. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've been told I'm a rare individual, and it's not just because I'm against the death penalty or I head up the National Coalition to abolish the death penalty, because actually ending the death penalty is becoming more and more a mainstream issue. By all objectives, uh, ways of anal analyzing the issue, the death penalty is on the decline. The public uh, support is at an all-time low, and opposition is increasing, and in fact, the death penalty is being relegated more and more to a handful of states. We've seen fewer executions. In the last year, we only saw 35 in the whole country. And 80% of the executions took place in three states, Texas, Missouri, and Florida. So that's not why I'm a rare individual. I'm told I'm a rare individual because I'm a Washingtonian. Now, as it turns out, that's a myth. But how many conversations have you been in when people say, there's nobody actually from D.C. Well, I'm actually from D.C., and my parents are actually from D.C., and my grandparents are actually from D.C. 
And in fact, until about the third grade, my parents and I shared a home with my grandparents uh, on Monroe Street in what's now Columbia Heights. So we had a great setup. I had a, uh, we had an apartment on the top floor. My grandparents lived downstairs. It was great. I could get two breakfasts, two dinners. <laughs> when I got into trouble, I could run downstairs and, you know, sidle up to Granny and Grandpa. And my grandmother had um, a real love for coffee. And she would always fix me a special cup. Now, my mother would never let me have coffee, but my grandmother would fix me a special cup that was mostly half and half in sugar. Remember when people still use half and half? <laughs> um, my grandfather also had his own favorite drink. That was something he called a horse's head, which I think today we'd call a float. It was like uh, big scoops of ice cream and Coca-Cola. But it was wonderful growing up with my parents, uh, living upstairs and my grandparents downstairs. Uh, I learned a lot from my grandmother about faith. My grandmother, um, in her later years, didn't attend church regularly, but she always had her radio on, listening to her preachers. And somehow she was able to navigate uh, all the, sort of the usual political traps of you know, what their particular political views were to get her real kernel of truth for her. I also learned a lot about charity from my grandmother. My grandmother was so proud of her little children, she'd get those pictures from the children she'd support with five or two or twelve dollars a month. So I learned a lot about faith and charity and what it meant to sort of every individual do their part to make the world better. My grandmother came to live with us. We ultimately moved, uh, but she came to live with us again when my grandfather passed away. And I remember two occasions when I saw my grandmother cry. I must have been too young, or my parents must have shielded us, because I'm sure she must have been very, very grief-stricken when my grandfather passed away. Joe Williams, as she would call him, was the love of her life. But the two occasions I remember was first when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and we're watching the funeral on our little black and white TV, and I saw this one tear roll down my grandmother's cheek. And as a kid, you know, whenever somebody you look up to shows a strong emotion, that makes an impression. So I remember that. The other occasion I remember seeing my grandmother cry was when I used to watch an old movie called King of Kings. It would come on every Easter and it told the story of Easter and we'd all get together. My grandmother, being very religious, wanted us all kids to get around and watch this movie and get its message. And I remember watching my mother, grandmother cry as, as she saw the story of Easter unfold. For me, the scene that always caught my eye was the trial. And I remember being so outraged, it was so unfair. The judge was so clearly politically motivated and the charges were so clearly false and nobody was standing up and saying, that's wrong. And the defendant, the defendant stood there and didn't even put out his own defense. And I would yell at the TV, that's wrong, can't you see that's a lie? Why don't you speak up for yourself? My grandmother would, hush, hush, I'm trying to watch the show. <laughs> but. I don't have to do much more to tell you. That's probably when the public interest lawyer was born. You know, then I went on uh, and tried on all the usual possible occupations as a kid. I thought about being an interior designer. I thought about theater. I thought about medicine, but discovered I didn't like the sight of blood or couldn't dissect cadavers. But I kept coming back to this issue of justice. As a teenager, I would read the newspaper and read about people in trouble or cases, and I would be imagining how I might be able to help. Who was speaking up for those people? So fast forward, um, I became a public interest lawyer, worked for the National, Co National Women's Law Center and fought injustice there. Now work for the National Coalition to abolish the death penalty, and we have the, the, uh, the death penalty issue. Now, there's one clear solution to the death penalty and fair courts, because we've already heard a little bit about how the death penalty and fair courts really, uh, the death penalty perverts even further the challenges of having a fair court. So we could get rid of the death penalty. I'm, I'm working on that. But I want you to sort of hear some ways in which the place that should be the purest place, the place that should be the place where it's the fairest, uh, when an individual is on trial for his or her life, it's when we absolutely cannot have any idea that the courts are not fair. You know, Alabama, we're going to talk a little bit more about Alabama. Uh, Alabama is one of three states where judges can override the jury's decision 
to impose a sentence other than death. But Alabama is the only state where an elected judge can do that. And there is an eerie, uncanny, and unseemly correlation between the rate at which Alabama judges override jury decisions for life in favor of death. And that correlation is around election time. And we've seen over and over again, I'm thinking right now about a man named Walter McMillan, who spent six years on death row. You may hear more about him. He was on, in Alabama on death row. He was sentenced to death after a day and a half trial for a crime for which there were 25 witnesses, African-American witnesses saying he was at a fish fry, a church fish fry. But Walter McMillian um, was an African-American man. He was known to have dated a white woman in the town. And the victim in the town was white. The jury, nevertheless, recommended a life sentence for Walter McMillian. But the judge overrode his uh, life sentence and imposed a death sentence. Happened to be an election year. That's a problem. You know, last year we all focused for a while on the horrible botched execution in Oklahoma. But it's worth remembering that there was a constitutional crisis that preceded that. Now, as states have gotten more uh, rare, uh, the ones that are working to, in, to have the death penalty are, have gotten to be more rare and more isolated, they've gotten more extreme, they've gotten more secretive. And they've also started to run out of the drugs that they use. So there's a whole controversy around the drugs that they use. And the state's response is to kind of grab anything off the shelf, tell us it's a secret, and say, this, just trust us, it'll go fine. Well, in Oklahoma, they did this. They, 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 they chose a drug that the Supreme Court recently looked at. And they, they, they were going to execute a whole group of, of, of prisoners. And the, the lawyers tried to find out, first of all, what is the drug? So we can shine some light on this. Is this going to work? Is this going to torture our, pris our, 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 our client? Uh, and so they went into court. And the Oklahoma State Supreme Court originally said, you know, guys, you really should kind of tell the, the defendant what you're planning to kill them with, and you give them a real hearing about this. And so they originally did the right thing. But the state legislature went ballistic. Uh, a member of the legislature actually introduced a legislation to impeach the justices for their decision. And the governor of the state said, wait a minute, I don't even care what the, what the justices said. We're going to go ahead with this, this execution anyway. And so, under pressure, they reversed themselves. And then we had the result that we had, which is the fact that we had a horribly botched execution because the drugs had not been properly vetted, and that's what happened. Supreme Court, this term, looked at this issue about whether or not uh, midazolam, the drug that was used, could actually uh, propose too great a risk that it would be a torturous death. And unfortunately, the, the majority said, you know, uh, we're going to defer to what goes on at the lower court. We're going to defer to their factual finding that it was fine. Uh, and notwithstanding a lot of evidence to the contrary, the court ruled in favor of the state of Oklahoma. Now, there's a lot there. Uh, it, again, reinforces the importance of fair courts. If the court, Supreme Court's going to defer to what goes on at the lower court level, uh, it, that's got to be right. But the other thing that people need to, to be mindful of is some of the language that has been used both in that case uh, and in others about what they view to be the proper role of courts. You know, Justice Scalia talking about unelected judges as if that's a bad thing. You know, that narrative is very, um, it's very seductive and very divisive and, and harmful to what we're trying to say. You know, if there's anybody who we should be able to trust, it's judges that don't have a political uh, dog in the fight, right? So, 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 the, yeah, that's right. So, so, so that's that's the issue there. So, we've got to watch this. So, why do I care about fair courts? I think it's because that little girl who was yelling at the TV had an instinctive sense of justice and fairness. Um, and so, when I do this work, I'm actually letting that little girl do what she feels like she was meant to do is to, to seek more justice and to seek a place in the courts that's fair for everybody. Now, 
I don't think that my story, minus the details, is probably much different from most of you here. I bet most of you here were probably the kid on the playground who looked out for the kid that might have been a little smaller, a little weaker. Some of us, or some of you might have even been the kid that was a little smaller who appreciated the, the, little older, ki the older kid who looked out for you. And that's really my point. If the courts are going to protect us, we have to protect the courts. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to say, oh, am I, am I mic? Okay. Um, th these incredibly talented people, we had one uh, brief prep call where we said, bring your passion to a talk about uh, fair courts. Um, because so often what we, we find is uh, kind of what we saw in the before video. We asked people, you know, talk about fair courts, um, make them attractive to, to a constituency. And, and a lot of times there's a temptation to sort of fall back on the traditional words and phrases, pillar of our democracy, uh, things of that nature with, you know, all due respect to talk number one, because it was fantastic. Oh. We, <laughs> um, we definitely see a difference when we ask people to, to talk personally and to tell a story. And we, we hear a lot that, uh, not only do we want to relate the issue of fair courts to other interest areas, but we want more stories. And I think what, I, what our panelists demonstrate is that everyone has a story, um, mm -hmm. first of all, so you can find it within yourself. But then there, are, are, there really are a wealth of other stories that you as issue advocates probably have at your fingertips among folks in your own orbits um, who can help you with that. So um, if you have questions, please write them down on the cards and uh, start doing that now to, to bring them up to the front. But I wanted to uh, ask our panelists a couple of questions. How did that feel, telling, uh, telling the story and talking about fair courts from that perspective as opposed to maybe how you might have done it in the past? Diane. It felt, it felt strange and good. For, as a lawyer, you, 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 go to, you go to those legal issues. But I, I like the exercise of trying to find something personal that related to, related to this work. And it, yeah. so it was, kind of, it's kind of, it was really special to have to do that. That's great. Eric? Um, I was just glad to have a captive audience that was receptive <laughs> to listening to Fair Court's messaging. Because what we typically find is no matter, we really strive to, these stories are real. These people's yeah. lives are real. Mm -hmm and these injustices are real. But uh, to cut through a lot of the noise um, and to get folks to see that these are issues that touch on all of the issues that they work on every single day is a challenge because we have so much on our plates. Um, so, you know, this felt good. This felt good. I'm sorry if everybody else didn't enjoy it. <laughs> I had a good time. <laughs> I don't know. And Mike? Well, I loved uh, my, my, my uh, partners here, uh, their presentations. For, my, for, for me, though, I found the whole experience to be quite humiliating. <laughs> it was just, uh, no, no, it's like you, you, you have to see yourself up there. And I, and I rem remember when they, they kidnapped me and brought me into the Justice at Stake <laughs> headquarters. And I remember I'm thinking, oh, I, better, I, I, was, I was almost think, in my mind, I'm like, OK, the website, what are the talking points? You know, I was trying to do that. Um, but yeah, I think that any time you show the personal side and you try to relate to people about what moves you around an issue and why you got involved, I think, uh, I think that resonates so much more. And then, you know, there's time and place for the talking points, those are needed. But to grab their attention, I think you have to add that personal piece. So Diane, your organization recently uh, did conduct some extensive messaging research um, that, that has really kind of reframed your approach to the issue. So what lessons from that research would you offer to fair course advocates? Perhaps? Well, I think uh, we started, we have been working for about four years with a group called um, the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute of Harvard for Race and, and Justice and a research group called Frameworks Institute. And they do public opinion research. And so the thing I've learned more is about how people think about issues and how the gap between what experts say, which this fits in very well with, and how people think about it once it gets into their heads. Because people carry around a lot of cultural norms that get translated in their heads that don't necessarily come out the way we think they come out. So uh, I learned the importance of that research and trying to figure out how to talk to people from where they are and then help move them to um, a better understanding of the issues we're trying to teach them about. 
Do we have any questions from the audience? Because I see we, we are running close to the, uh, the time limit. So if we have questions from the audience, please pass them forward. OK. <laughs> no. OK. Um, so Eric, what would you say to, to folks who ask why state courts are still important now in the wake of the, uh, the Supreme Court decision? Why state um, courts are still important. Yeah. So America. the marriage equality issue has dominated a lot of the discourse around LGBT issues, but uh, there, the truth is there is so much more to do, and a lot of that work uh, is in state courts. We are still fighting in the trenches against explicit government discrimination. It is the case that you can go, in Tennessee, they have the freedom to marry now that uh, Obergefell was decided. You can go and get married in Tennessee on Saturday. You can go, and as a result of that, be denied a hotel room on Sunday in Tennessee. And then on Monday, be fired from your job. On Tuesday, be denied a loan. And then on Wednesday, be evicted from your apartment. Um, and that's because, Tennessee, like 28 other states, does not have explicit protections for sexual orientation and gender identity in their state statutes. So in those states that have these laws, we will be in the state courts fighting to enforce these laws. And in those states that don't have those laws, we will be fighting in state courts to see that protections on the basis of sex properly cover sexual orientation and gender di identity discrimination. And at the same time, we all know that 97% of all cases are ha handled by state courts. Nearly all of family law issues are handled by state courts. Family law issues are really the bread and butter of the everyday lives of LGBT people who are looking for equal protection, equal extension of the presumption of parentage that applies to different sex couples, um, to a fair application of the best interest of the child standard. Oftentimes, people's transgender identity is used against them in a best interest of the child analysis to take away someone's children from them. Um, transgender people are seeking employment issues, health issues, access to bathrooms, um, access to health care. And the truth is what we're looking at now is the fight gets a lot harder because it's easier to advocate for marriage equality than it is to advocate for uh, access to HIV medication for an LGBT, undocumented, uh, immigrant detainee. Um, and that's the work that we're trying to do, but it's just, it's harder. And we can all admit that there are some serious fair courts issues when we look at across all of those areas. Um, so our work for LGBT equality continues, our work on fair courts certainly continues. Um, but state courts yeah. are, the, are the key. Absolutely key. Uh, I'm gonna read this one first. It's because it's a, a compliment for our great speakers. Uh, so the writer says, I don't have a question, but as a communications professional, I'd like to say those were outstanding presentations and exactly underlined twice uh, what people hear and even more important, what they remember. The science on this is overwhelming. So there you go, guys. That's <laughs> they were great. Um, I hope I'm reading this one correctly. It's uh, beyond extended verbal narratives. Uh, specifically, how can you get the story out about judges and justices and the work of the court? The work of the court. Um, and I, I do think that this is interrelated with the, with the kinds of stories that uh, we're told about folks' interactions with the courts. Um, but do you folks have any thoughts immediately about how getting out the word about judges and justices and the work of the court, maybe adding a little bit of that education aspect might be done through this approach. Well, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the challenges uh, is that, you know, we have 50 separate uh, uh, state courts, right? And, and, you know, so some of my members, I have a, a member from Missouri and, and he learned about the abuses with these elections and the television commercials and radio ads when he was traveling across country with his family during election time. He, he didn't realize how, how bad it was in, in various different uh, places. So I think what's, what's critical, especially for groups like mine, I represent a, a group of business stakeholders, is to communicate to them uh, the key messages and get them to be 
to be what we call business champions, get those individuals to see that this has this is a challenge in in in, in some places more than in others, and and to unite them behind a, you know a common purpose here. So, um, I with talking about judges and uh, the work of what courts do, I. Um, you know, the survey that we did really reveals a lot about people's real perceptions of the way courts are seen by the public. And I just would caution others and ask others to help, you know, we're going through it ourselves, but to really talk to real people and make sure that the messaging that we're using is really resonating with them. Because for a lot of people, this protect the judges, protect the courts, is not their everyday lived experiences dealing with that municipal court judge or a state court judge where they're looking for access, or maybe they don't even get into a judge, get to see a judge. So there, there's a way that we talk about fair courts that we need to balance those big civil rights cases where we do need to protect the Iowa justices so that they have judicial independence. But at the same time, talk to people where they are about the ways that they interact with the court system and connect with their values about why they want those courts to be fair. Right. Diane, what would you say about making the work of the courts? I was, thinking, I, I was going to pick up on a point that was made in one of the uh, breakout groups uh, that Deborah made, was that you've done some research that is, is some good news, which shows that people already have a high regard for judges generally. Um, and I think that to re reinforce that message so that, so that people, it, it, it becomes the norm to think about people of high integrity that are not swayed. Um, at, at the same time that we then explain to people more of the technical pieces of why that's important. But I, I think elevating the, the notion of the impartial judge as the standard might give people something to look at or be able to better understand the issue when they see judges politicking or they see people attacking judges for taking stands that they have to. So I think people understanding why you need an impartial judge. They're there to protect the discrete and insular minority. Mm -hmm. And often we talk about, when, as defenders of fair courts, we, we start from a place where we, um, I hate to say assume, but that most people take that as a sort of a right. presumption. Our courts are fair and impartial, and therefore we must right. protect them, and that's not where everybody starts. That's right. That's the starting point for everybody, so it's important to recognize that. You, Mike, you, you started to touch on this, so I'm going to follow up a little bit on, um, on the business community because um, how would you advise fair courts advocates interested in building bridges with the br business community uh, to do that a bit better? And, and what's perhaps the best approach for those who don't come from a business background? Well, um, I, th I think you always have to um, think um, creatively. <laughs> um, I think one of the things is that you, you need to talk to them about how this is in their interest. But I also think you, you need to talk to them about the economics behind this. I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is an issue that affects companies and it affects their bottom line. And I think when you, I think there are so many wonderful s stories to be told uh, by people who represent groups here. But when you're talking to the business community, they're going to want to hear, all right, how is this going to uplift people's lives? And how is this going to create a citizenry uh, of taxpayers, of, of individuals who can, can give back to the community? You know, one of the things that I think has been very interesting has been the whole um, uh, interplay between business and, and gay marriage and, and that whole issue because a lot of companies, for their own self-interest, you know, they stood up when they started to hear some of these crazy politicians make these awful, hurtful comments. Um, but I think one of the things that you, you find is that uh, you know, the business community, you know, they care about a bottom line uh, but they also care about their customers. And I think as much as we can relate this to their customers, to the economy, and to the well-being of the country, that's the way to go. I think one question that people might have sometimes is, where do I find stories if I'm not sure? Um, because we can, we can dig within ourselves uh, for, for good stories, but obviously in Eric's talk, we heard quite a few other specific examples. So how would you folks advise people to to find the, the stories that will help tell the story within your own organizations, perhaps, or um, if you're speaking to your own constituencies. Because I would say many of them are in the news, right? I mean, you can, you can start by looking at current events. And they have a lot more compelling stories than <laughs> I do. But I did tell a story, you know, mm -hmm. and that was, you know, that was a, a representative from a big company 
and that was and and that I was talking about. And so I think as much as you can talk to organizations that have stakeholders involved that are key to this, um, you know, find those stories. You know, there are there are business people who will tell you they don't want to get hit up for the, these kinds of contributions, and and you can tell their stories. Right. We do a lot with social media, and so a part of social media is really staying on top of the news. Uh, and I think that part of what we've started to trying to do is sort of catalog, even informally, things that we see in the news, stories that we know will be compelling to make the case. And so many of you already probably have that function going on in your office. It's just a matter of making sure that you're also looking for stories that can be used uh, over and over again to sort of illustrate your point. So I think it, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. um, we have a help desk, so we receive you know, hundreds of calls of real people who've encountered discrimination. We have community educators that go out into the field and talk to people about their lived experiences and, um, and bring them back so that we can know where we need to focus our attention. Um, but, you know, we're not also, a lot of the work that we do is appellate level advocacy. Mm -hmm. So the people that we hear and the stories that we encounter aren't the people who are dealing with the trial level courts. So I think it's really important to have conversations with people who are court involved, with people who are serving low income communities, mm -hmm. people who are involved in trial and municipal courts so that we know what their stories are and we're not only talking about mm -hmm. fair courts issues at the appellate level. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we find this approach can work quite well when you talk about your own lived experience as you say but also some of these very um, very moving examples can, can be woven in as well. How, here's a question from the audience. How is your organization or how are your organizations connecting your cause with the fair courts message in a way that targets the rising generation? Diane? Well, we're happy to be here. Um, and, and I want to say right now, we want to think about how we can do this together next year as well. So I think that that's part of it. Uh, we are also looking at social media uh, and how do we reach more people and thinking about how to get these, our issue um, and these issues connected uh, more to the universities. So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just excited, like Kate said, to be included in this millennials conversation. <laughs> I still consider myself, we're Googling it to make sure that we can join. But, um, but gee, how do you relate to them? Um, I think that our generation, I'm going to include myself there, I'm done, it, um, is concerned about democracy issues. We realize that our legislature, other, other things that are there to protect the democratic process are really broken. Um, and we've had a lot of help with that from some decisions from the Supreme Court to break it even further. But people are aware and they're passionate about it. And they're connecting the issues that they care about, whether it's the environment or, um, or criminal justice or uh, policing, to these issues uh, because they're all interconnected. And I think that's where we need to be. Well, Eisenhower was president when I was born. <laughs> um, I don't think enough the answer to the question. CEDs actually utilize the, uh, our network of, of business schools from around the country and engage with the rising, you know, the up and coming people who are going to be the next generation of CEOs and senior executives of companies to talk about public policy in general. Um, so we've done some of that, but I don't think we've done enough to engage uh, the millennials, and I think that's, uh, that's a challenge for us. So before we wrap up, I wanted to give each of our panelists an opportunity to just say a couple of final words about maybe how this experience changed uh, your thoughts about talking about fair courts, uh, and Sorry, well, you, your takeaway from this experience. I, I think the biggest takeaway was the importance of connecting my personal experience to why I do this work. And as I said, for a lot of reasons, sometimes we like we hide behind the legalese, we hide behind the policy, because it's hard to share yourself as a person. But I think ultimately, what we're trying to do is convince people one person at a time. And so the exercise of going inside and reminding ourselves why we do this work is really, I think, a key to engaging more people in this effort. So I learned that. Eric, did you have final thoughts? Um, not really. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> because it's lunchtime, isn't it? It, it is. It's just almost because lunchtime. Because lunch. <laughs> Mike, any final thoughts? Uh, I'll, only that, you know, um, <laughs> I've been in Washington since 1981. It's a, it can be a very superficial town. Um, we, we all have a facade. 
We all try to present ourselves as someone else. Uh, what this taught me is, is to open up a little bit more mm -hmm. and to show the personal side, show your, your, um, your history and, and some of the uh, stories that you have to share and that that, that can help uh, get to where you want to go. I want to thank our panelists so much. And I do have a quick announcement since we're talking about the rising generation. I'll pick that up in a second. Uh, we are about to serve lunch, but there will be a millennial round table during the lunch program. And for those who would like to attend that, uh, the millennial round table is in the Vista room, in the Vista room. Thank you so much, everybody.